Welcome to Behavioral Economics Fundamentals. My name is Guthrie, and I am a behavioral economist. I'm also the COO of the Team W, where I've spoken, taught, consulted on many issues, including a lot of behavioral economics ones for years. I have a degree in economics from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and a law degree from the Loyola University School of Law in Chicago, where I currently live. I am also a licensed attorney in the state of Illinois. So why behavioral economics? And I just want to say first, there's not going to be any math here. One of the um, reasons that I created these courses is because there's so much really great research uh, and insights about behavioral economics. I think it's very powerful, very cool, very useful. However, it can be very dense and difficult to uh, explain the concepts and uh, usually can I may maybe scare off some of the people with some of the math based variable um, inclinations that these that these topics have. I wrote a book called I Love You Now Read This Book. It's about decision making and behavioral economics. And in that book, I tried really hard to um, well, first of all, I read a bajillion research papers, uh, highlighted and summarized all the important statistically significant information, and then taught that or wrote about it in a easy to understand and sort of fun way. So that was really um, what I'm trying to do here. So I'm going to be focusing on the research side of things to help give you some big, big ideas that are backed up by research, some um, broad new perspectives, and hopefully a better understanding of economics and especially behavioral economics without having to do um, the math side of it. Now, this Behavioral economics is a is a part. I mean, it's sort of a how do you want to define it? There's this big body knowledge called behavioral science, and behavioral science is just what do we know about humans and decision making, and uh, that that's that's sort of uh, the way our brains work. It's just a, it's a big broad category, and in there there's behavioral psychology, which uh, we also do a lot of teaching about. But behavioral psychology is more about what do we know about humans that are consistent across everyone. So for example, I get vision or the science of creativity, stuff that's specific about the way our brains are wired. Um, behavioral economics kind of takes things maybe to the next step, and it's context dependent. So what will this particular person giving their specific circumstances and this particular moment do given these particular options. So it is very variable centric. And I, I remember when I was um, when I was a, uh, taking my econ classes, there was a running joke, you know, what's the answer to every econ problem? And the answer is it depends. Um, and then there is there is some truth to that. So we're going to talk about some big, big concepts here. I'm going to give you just the highlights. If you'd like to know more, I really do encourage you to read the original papers, or more importantly, um, check out the entire certificate that I've created, uh, the Behavioral Economics Certificate. Now, this is not all of the behavioral economics research out there. Uh, this is just a slice of stuff I thought was important or cool um, or very useful to people in their, uh, in their careers. So I'm going to go over some of these broad topics. I'm going to break it down um, by the different courses uh, that, that I have in the Behavioral Economics Certificate, but I, really my focus was to be short, concise, uh, give you some cool things to think about, uh, give you some ideas so you can start thinking like a behavioral economist um, and sort of get into that mindset, uh, which, which I think is very important. At the end of the day, behavioral economics is a wonderful, um, uh, flourishing area of research. I think it explains humans in a way that is much more realistic than maybe some of the traditional ways that um, people think about humans and the way we make decisions. And at its core, I think it's a lot of fun. And I think it's really cool and really interesting. So I encourage you to have a good time, enjoy this uh, short fundamentals course. Hopefully you learn some stuff and hopefully this will just encourage your interest in the field of behavioral economics. So let's get started. Let's talk about one of the most important concepts, I think, in behavioral economics, and it's this idea that humans calculate by feel. Now, I personally think that economics as a field of study really started in about the 1950s when people started using math, econometrics, uh, really diving into the modeling aspect of it. And before then, I mean, it was fine, but in my personal opinion, that was more economic philosophy than economics itself. Um, you know, supply equals demand, that's, that's great. 
Um, but it's, it wasn't really until the math and the modeling got into play that that's really when economics started. But one of the problems when you're trying to model something as complex as human behavior, human decision making, um, is that it's complex. And so simplifying it is sort of a necessity if you're going to get anywhere. And so out of that sort of 1950s era uh, came this idea of the rational actor model. And it was this idea of human behavior that, and human decision making, that basically the person is rational and they're always making decisions that are in their best self-interest. And this sort of makes sense. So if I have here $10 in this hand and $5 in this hand, and I say, pick one, no strings attached, I'm gonna, you can pick one of these two options, would you rather have $10 or $5? And everyone picks the 10. And the, and the rational actor model says, yeah, 10 is more than five, your brain calculates that, you, you're rational, you make the decisions that are rational to you, and we move on. And that's close enough. Um, I like to use the analogy of uh, physics. So there's sort of Newtonian physics where, yeah, if apples are falling from the tree, sure, it's a good approximation of how things work. But that's not really how things work. It's actually way more complicated. There's relativity and quantum mechanics. And in economics, it's like, sure, rational actors, I guess, sort of works, but it's not actually what's happening inside our brains. That's, that's, that's what I think. And there's a ton of research um, that really backs this idea up. And the, when, when I, in, the, in the full certificate, I really go through time and time again and just show oh, it's another nail in the rational actor model because there's so much evidence, especially in the field of behavioral economics, that that is just not how we are walking around um, making decisions whatsoever. It's just not how we think. We are messy biological creatures. And this sort of computer program calculating all the variables and okay, so if I have, uh, if I offer you chocolate over here and tomatoes over here and you don't like tomatoes, well, chocolate has a, has a feel score of, you know, 1.45 and tomatoes has 0.35 and therefore chocolate's higher and I'm calculating. That's not how we do things. Humans calculate by feel. So rather than the rational actor model, I would like to uh, propose um, the human feel model. I think it's a much more accurate way of how humans are making decisions. And if you sort of start to think about this way, I think a lot of things make sense. I think the academic research about why people are doing things the way they're doing things uh, makes a lot more sense. And it's just a cool way of thinking about humans. So the way the human feel model works is pretty simple. Again, we are not calculating like a computer program. That's not how we do things. When we're faced with a decision, we're trying to get to one decision, one of the options that feels right. In order to make a decision, we need one that feels right. So let's say, again, we have our tomatoes and we have our chocolate. These are the two. Chocolate feels right because we don't like tomatoes, so we go with chocolate. That's easy, simple. If it feels right, we go with it. If there are multiple choices that feel right, so let's say we have tomatoes and we have chocolate, and we also have, we'll just say, peanut butter, okay? I like chocolate, I like peanut butter, hmm, which one should I go with today uh, or at this, at this moment? We've eliminated tomatoes. When we're, when we're faced with uh, multiple options that also feel right, we expand, we pull out, we take a new perspective. We use different variables to try and figure out uh, what we should do. So for example, we have tomatoes, we have chocolate, we have uh, peanut butter, which one, would you like as a snack right now? Okay, not tomatoes. Both of these feel right. What did I have recently? I had chocolate for lunch, so let's go with peanut butter, right? I've added another variable to try to get more perspective, to try to shift the way I'm thinking about things and maybe something will feel right given that new perspective. So again, then we have one that feels right and we take that decision. So that's just a, that's just a really high level thought about the idea that humans calculate by feel. Now, most of this course is actually about the research and situations uh, behind where humans are calculating by feel. And it's all these different outcomes and uh, I don't have um, time, and that's why I encourage you to take the full course, so you can listen to all this really cool stuff, to go through all these ideas. But just as a general um, you know, thought, so for example, when people estimate calories, uh, if, someone th if you think a food is healthy, you will assume that it has less calories than a food that you think is unhealthy. How you feel about certain things is affecting how you are making valuations. Imagine if you have uh, your grandfather's desk that he made by hand and is given to you, and you ask, hey, what's the value of this desk? 
Maybe it's a crappy desk and it's actually not worth much. But to you, because of the story and your grandfather and the feelings you have about it, your valuation of this object is changing. You're not calculating it uh, even in the marketplace as just sort of a uh, unthinking, unemotional like computer program. You're calculating by feel. And the and markets in the real world are being affected by the psychology of its of it of the participants. Whether it's the stuff you're working on um, at your job, whether it's the stock market, whether it's the housing market. I mean the way people are making decisions and making valuations about stuff is all because of the way we feel and it's the feelings that we're making valuations and making decisions upon. So Humans, again, we're calculating by feel. We're not calculating like a computer program. And it leads to all these interesting cognitive biases. And a cognitive bias is just a quirk of human behavior because of the way our brain structures are. Um, so like the ownership bias, which I mentioned, uh, there's the status quo bias. You know, I just like the, the sunk cost bias or fallacy. There are all these different ways that this idea that humans calculate by feel manifests. Um, and so in the... Uh, full course, I, I go through a bunch of the research, but there's a ton of it out there, and it's very convincing, in my opinion, and very cool. Um, so just to change your perspective, remember, and I'll say it again and again, humans calculate by feel. We're feeling out and reading our emotions and figuring out how much we like or dislike something, and that's how we're making evaluations. Usually, because, you know, we, we're smart, that lines up with the rational actor model. We see $10, we feel better about $10 than $5, so we're making the, the, the choice that a computer program would make often, but not always. And lots of Nobel Prizes are going out to this kind of work. This is why, again, behavioral economics is great. It's a much more realistic way of the way humans are making decisions. So in sum, humans calculate by feel. One big idea of behavioral economics is the idea of social in interactions and social pressure. We are very social animals, and being social and the pressure it puts on us changes and influences our decision making in ways that we usually underestimate. So in research that I go through in the full uh, certificate course, uh, you can ask people, hey, how, in which way are you going to be influenced the strongest? And people rate social interactions or social pressure low. They think, ah, I'm my own person, I make my own decisions. And then when you do it in the real world and see what made the biggest impact, it's social interactions and pressure. We are very, very influenced um, by uh, other people's view of us, by society. You know, we live in a society. And that pressure is incredibly strong, incredibly motivating, and really impacts our decision making in profound ways. So just just for an example, we talked to, you know, we, we talk about the rational actor model that we always take the five, you know, five dollars if it's a free five dollars, why not? Five dollars is more than zero. Now imagine that you're walking down the street and there in the gutter amongst garbage and bird poop or something is a five dollar bill. And you're the type of person who would just walk over and you'll grab it because it's five dollars and five dollars is more than zero dollars. It's free money and you wash it off. What? No big deal. But let's say you're walking with, uh, let's say someone on your left and someone on your right. And the person on your left is someone you have a romantic interest in or you, uh, maybe it's a spouse, a partner, maybe it's a, f a better, even better than that, it's a crush someone who you would like to impress. And the person on your, on your right is someone in your career who you'd like to impress. Maybe it's a professor, maybe it's your boss, someone you very much admire and want their admiration and respect. Um, and so you, you go over to grab the, dot, the $5 lying in the bird poop and the two people turn and look at you and they say, oh, you're not gonna touch that, are you? You wouldn't be the type of person who would touch dirty, poop money. <laughs> now, maybe some of you are the type of person who say, I don't care, I'm still at $5. A rational actor model says you always pick up the $5. There's a lot of people who just won't. Um, and you can say that you would, but in the real world, if you actually had those social pressures in you, you probably don't. It's amazing that it, how strong this idea of we need to fit in the group will influence even getting free money. 
Um, and one other way that I want to talk about that I think is really important of the way that uh, uh, this body of research is really cool is the idea of cultures of trust. So people think trust is one thing. They think trust is formed through kindness and teamwork. And really, if you look at the research, if you would like to create a culture of trust and sharing, you must easily allow for public shaming and retaliation. Trust is built on punishment. Trust is built on punishment. And so the retaliation doesn't have to be in money. It can again be in social status, uh, people making, you know, the community members shunning someone um, or collectively punishing the selfish. But, but to achieve maximum good behavior requires constant and reliable punishment 100% of the time applied fairly and evenly across all people depending on power structure. So that's, that's just one simple example of the importance of research into the social decision making and the way it can impact real world uh, jobs, pe the way people are interacting, and economies. So again, trust, very important and depends on punishment. Uh, do not underestimate the importance of social interactions and pressure. So this is just some of the big ideas. Uh, I hope you take the full course and uh, to, to dive into some of the details because some of the research is really, really fascinating. But do not underestimate the impact of social interactions and pressure.